I think I was thinking about the paradoxes, mm -hmm. um, you know, of how little minute and unimportant we are, but yet special, because right now we're the only life form that we know. Yeah, and, oh. and the only intelligent life, life form that we know, and the only life form that we know that has actually the kind of cognitive capacity to have yeah. figured all of this out, that, you know, I, I mean, I think the thing that stuns me, right, is in 1543 when Copernicus reordered the universe. And remember, the universe at the time was just the solar system, right? We didn't know what else existed. We saw some stars, but we didn't know that there was this vast universe out there. And he could have never imagined that, you know, two years ago, human beings, right, we built these two satellites, the Voyagers 1 and 2, that actually left the confines of the solar system. Could you imagine that? No way, right? And I think that similarly, you know, we cannot predict the course of future science. And for me, that is what is so exciting. And that's what makes me um, remain open to all kinds of crazy ideas and possibilities, because who knows, right? But on the other hand, I think I sort of you have to you have to balance that out with a sense of humility, which is you know, on the other hand, there is no reason that this sort of cantaloupe-sized gelatinous object in our skulls, that we'll be able to figure everything out, everything that there is to figure out, including itself, right? So, I don't know, I mean, this is a debate that I often get into with many of my uh, scientists and philosopher friends, whether everything is knowable to us. And I reckon maybe not. I mean, there's no reason to believe um, that everything is knowable. But on the other hand, you know, we have history that uh, history of science has shown us that we don't have the capacity to make future predictions about what science might find and what technology will enable us to do. And you write, you write frequently in your book about the tension of this, the psychology of our, our cantaloupe-sized brain um, and how the limits of our psychology continually butt up against. Yeah. And how, and how our human psychology has really shaped where we've gone scientifically. Absolutely, you paraphrased it even better than I could have. That well, I, think I have to simplify to understand <laughs> these things. <laughs> so, no, no, I think that, you know, um, what is amazing is that while we have these capacities and we have the language of mathematics and, you know, we've developed all these uh, incredible tools and instruments to probe nature and the cosmos, um, the fact that ultimately our minds impose limits on not just our understanding but our openness to change our understanding. So exactly. the fact is that you know there is a way in which we like uh, human beings prefer order and prefer stasis and sort of you know dis the sort of rapid changes in science and technology for example have been very disorienting our minds are quite remarkable they propel us forward but they also hold us back okay. and i think that that tension uh, scientists feel that a lot and that's something i get at at my in my book because i think what really intrigued me is part of scientific training is that you know we are taught to keep an open mind and you know that's part of the training that you have to be always ready to change your mind right and and yet even scientists when radical ideas of new ideas are presented to them they don't always um, immediately embrace them uh -huh.